Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, we've come down to Fairview Garden Center. It's uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. It's uh, down on Holly Springs Road, a little south of what, it, really almost in the middle of kind of Cary and Apex and Holly Springs and Raleigh, right in the middle of all the growth here in the Triangle area in the center part of North Carolina. Beautiful garden center. They have one of the most amazing greenhouse operations. They do a lot of growing of their own on, on their annuals here. And then they have a big shrub selection, indoor selection really really nice place and you're just surrounded by color in these you know very large greenhouse uh, space and if it's a rainy day outside you can still come and shop here we're going to cover some shade annuals in this video and we came over here because they had a good selection of them we won't be able to cover all the annuals that we use in the shade or can recommend for you in the shade um, i'll list some toward the end of the video that you can also uh, take a look at if, in your local garden center when we talk about annuals, we're talking about plants that come up, the, tr the definition of annuals. A plant that germinates, comes up, flowers, produces seed, and then literally dies. And so this list of about 10 that we're about to show you, only one is actually a true annual, where it, that's, it, that's its life cycle. The rest of these, we're using them as annuals. Okay, so at, we're gonna start with begonias here. Begonias are a great shade uh, annual. Another thing you might think about is as you move further north in the country, these things may take more sun than they do here in the south. So what I'm describing as a shade annual might take a little more sun where you are. And as I'm describing it as an annual in Raleigh, North Carolina, maybe down in Florida, it's actually a perennial. So keep that in mind. Uh, begonias are just absolutely fantastic for any shade garden. There's tremendous amount of foliage uh, variation in them, a tremendous amount of flower variation in them. They can be used for hanging baskets. Some of them get larger, you know, two feet in height, whereas the wax leaf begonias that we have traditionally used in our gardens, you know, stay much smaller than that and much more compact. So we can use these in containers, hanging baskets. Uh, we have Rex begonias, again, the traditional uh, wax leaf begonias that you'll typically buy as, as bedding plants. There are tuberous begonias back here. There are uh, uh, angel wing begonias up here in this basket. So just a tremendous uh, variation. And through again, through plant breeding, we see that they have amazing foliage, you know, almost can be used like, col like coleus is as a, as a foliage plant. Uh, and then they're being used for brightly colored flowers and yellows and reds and oranges and all those kinds of things. Pretty much across the board, when we're talking about uh, these things that we're using as annuals in shady spaces, they're all going to want moist, very well-drained conditions. So none of these are going to want to sit in water. You can definitely rot begonias pretty quickly if it's a very wet space. We amend our annual beds with a little bit of compost and that compost feeds them pretty well, but it also drains pretty well. We would rather keep these on the slightly dry side and have to water them a little bit than worry that they're getting overwatered. Next up is one of our absolute favorites, it's Terenia. And we use Terenia in all of our shady spots in our garden. This is the one true annual in this entire list of annuals that we're using, uh, that we're gonna show you in this video. This is actually one that has a life cycle where it comes up from seed, uh, flowers all summer, produces seed, and then you know you can collect that seed. Uh, these will self-seed a little bit in the garden, but I don't consider them weedy at all. There's some, of, some annuals that we use in our garden or some annuals that you can use in your garden that can be quite seedy. And the next year, come up so many, come up with so many of them. It's not even fun to kind of garden with this one. One or two here or there, we'll see, we'll reseed. Through breeding, we see blues and purples and yellows and whites and so many different colors. Most of the ones that are on this table are trailing, so there's a lot of breeding going on to make these useful for hanging baskets, useful for ground covers. There's uh, we use the upright ones in our garden. They'll get so bushy during the summer that we will just kind of chop them in half at some point midsummer just to make sure that they're not flopping over. But they really don't need to be deadheaded. They're self-cleaning. The flowers, as Steph says, looks like it's somebody singing, you know, like, like, like an open mouth and they're just singing, singing loudly. Great color in a shady space. This is another one and a, pretty much the theme of this. None of these are going to want to stay particularly wet. 
So they need even moisture, uh, but they don't want to stay wet. These are pretty good at letting you know if they're dry uh, out in our shady spaces. And some of our shade spaces in our garden, there's a lot of root competition, so we need to do a little bit of watering on them. But I'd rather do that again than put them in a super wet spot and then lose them to root rot. Terrini has the perfect shaped flower to invite hummingbirds into your garden. This is also deer resistant. So if you have a, a woodland garden and you're looking to try to get some color in it during the summertime and you have deer issues, this is a great choice. Look at this amazing array of color. This is coleus. Again, it's not a true annual, but we use it as such in our landscape. There isn't a year go, that goes by that we don't have this as a splash of color in our shady garden. You can see amazing arrays of color in the leaves, just modeling, reds, yellows, greens, different leaf uh, shapes, an amazing selection. They do flower. Uh, it's best to pinch them off though because they take the energy away from the plant. Usually, quite honestly, at the end of the season when we know we're just letting them go, uh, we'll let them come to flower and the pollinators love them absolutely love them, uh, but we don't let them have them until the end of the season. Like the other things, they do like a well-drained soil, a little organic matter in there. Um, don't overwater them. That's immensely important because they will get that rot. What else can you say about a splash of color in the shade? Coleus is a wonderful option. <laughs> One thing that I would like to add is that um, we get lots of comments about how we use these in the landscape because we do put some of them in the full sun. There are varieties that will tolerate that more. We found that the wizard series of coleus really well takes the sun. Uh, not generally the greens and the yellows for us, they kind of burn, but those, those um, red kind of ones have done quite well for us in, in the full sun. Next up is sweet potato vines. Sweet potato vines can take sun or shade for us and in the shade you may actually lose a little bit of color depending on how how deep the shade is so the gold may be a slightly less gold and a little more green the black foliage varieties might be a little greener uh, not quite as not quite as dark but they do perfectly fine these again this is you know the coleus right before this not a true not a true annual uh, these are definitely not true annuals as well they store their energy they're tender and they die back to the tuber or the potato that's in that, that forms in the container these aren't traditionally considered edible but they're through plant breeding we've seen that treasure island series of uh, sweet potato vines come out that are quite are very edible they're uh, just as, they're supposed to be as good as any any sweet potato so that's an interesting thing. It's one of these things you can grow in a container or on the on a slope or someplace where you need a spreading, you know, vine through the summer where you want lots of color, and then you can eat it at the end of the season. But traditionally, they haven't been used that way. They can be dug up, stored, used again the next season if you want to. Brought inside as a house plant through the winter. When we're talking about shade things, where they're where they're shade tolerant outside when they come into your house they're probably going to need the brightest window you have so they're you know you, it's much darker in the house so a shade equivalent outside is usually the brightest place you have on the inside if you're trying to store these things uh, through the winter time but through breeding we've seen these incredible vivid gold variegated varieties dark uh, black foliage varieties. They're just fantastic for putting in a container and let, letting it just trail down to the ground. Again, they can go on a slope. We've seen them where people plant them and come over retaining walls. And in a single season, these can get six, eight feet, 10 feet, 12 feet wide and cover an entire wall very, very quickly. You don't need many of them uh, to go a long way. So sweet potato vines, definitely one that we always go to in the garden because it's just easy color. The sweet potato vines are in the morning glory family. They do flower, but it's pretty insignificant. They're really just grown for that foliage. Dichondra is also in the morning glory family and the morning glory family can be good at reproducing itself. Uh, this uh, Dichondra is beautiful. We use it as an annual in zone seven. There are, these can be hardy from zone seven down to zone 10 and be a bit invasive in southern areas, but from zone seven and up, great annual that we can use as a, as a spiller, you know, coming over the edge of a container can be used as any kind of, uh, just a ground cover that has this bluish silver 
foliage on it all summer. It can be used as a lawn uh, in, in warmer areas. Again, I don't want to use this if I'm further south because it can you know, be a, a bit of a bully in the garden, but used as an annual in northern areas, it's just such a fantastic plant for just, you, you know, you can put any colored, you know, any color up next to this in a container. So you can use something larger in a container that flowers and then use this as your spiller that comes over the side of the container. Uh, that's typically what we'll use it for. But this is really a part shade one and not a full shade one. It uh, doesn't do well in the full shade. Also doesn't do well with water. So this is another one that if you have a dry part shade space or a container that you're letting dry out between waterings, Dichondra is a perfect choice. Again, you're not buying this for flowers, you're buying it for foliage similar to the sweet potato vines. Next up is New Guinea and Patience. And uh, traditionally, uh, New Guinea and Patients are definitely for the shade. There are new varieties of these called Sun Patients that are definitely a lot more sun, sun tolerant uh, over the years. These will take morning sun, the traditional New Guinea and Patients. And then through breeding, we see oranges and whites and these bright, bright, hot pinks and uh, salmon colors and lavender one. We had a lavender one in the garden last year. I really love New Guinea in patience. Typically you won't find these in bedding plants like you do some of the other things. We'll get, we try to do stuff from seed and then we'll buy four packs and six packs of a lot of things. But I don't mind buying New Guinea in patience. I don't mind buying coleus. There's a few things I don't mind buying in bigger pots even if they cost a little more because I know over the course of the season this plant's gonna get this big by this big. It's gonna occupy a big space. The butterflies are gonna love it. Uh, that it, the flowers just made perfect for butterflies somehow. They, you know, they absolutely love these flowers. They're, you don't need to deadhead them. They're kind of, you know, they, they take care of themselves all summer long. Another one that definitely doesn't like wet feet. That's pretty much the theme of putting, if you're putting these seasonal color things in part shade or shade conditions, sometimes those areas can be wet and they'll get crown rot and die. So we have these in a slightly elevated bed with some compost. They're heavy feeders, but we get away with just fertilizing them a couple times with organic fertilizer and compost. We recompost the beds each year. What you're seeing in these is not just flower color, but also foliage color. So there's dark maroon colored foliage and red foliage and all kinds of things on these where it makes the flowers pop even more. But we typically will take and put one or three in a group on each side of our steps in the back garden and they're just incredible show-offs really again worth you know whatever somebody's charging in a slightly larger container because you're going to get so much bang for the buck with new guinea invasions next up is one of our all-time favorite go-to we use as an annual this is another tender perennial in the in the deeper south this is lobelia and we will typically start our lobelia from seed. It's a microscopic seed. It's easy to drop 10 of them into each little cell by accident because they're so tiny. Uh, they germinate pretty regularly. Some of these new ones though are definitely worth buying because you know through hybridization we've seen you know slightly larger flowers, very showy, very sturdy upright habits on them. Uh, we do a pretty big bed of these typically every year. The pollinators absolutely love them. Perfect shaped flower for that. They'll come in lavenders. Uh, so some are multicolored. We'll also see them in white. They tend to be a little spreading unless they're up on themselves like this and then they'll, they'll grow a little bit more vertical. We typically get about 12 inches out of them over the course of the season. Like a lot of these other annuals, you can give them a haircut during the summer if they're starting to get a little, if they're starting to slow down or they're starting to uh, not, not bloom as readily or they're falling apart, you know, just opening up and falling apart. You can give these a little bit of a haircut and they'll fill right back in very, very quickly. This is another one that just likes moist, very well drained soil. So another one that's pretty easy to rot, but it appreciates a little bit of water. Uh, and again, this is, uh, Lobelia is always just one of our favorites. It's not necessarily the brightest, showiest thing in the garden, but the pollinators love it. You can probably hear the rain on the top of the greenhouse. I hope I'm not yelling over it, but it is raining above us. And I've tried to film in greenhouses for years and years, and the rain, you know, the rain is very, very loud when you're inside of one. Next up is caladiums. Caladiums are just, it's amazing to me what was happened in caladiums in the last 
two decades. The, col the colors on them are just incredible. We're also seeing through plant breeding more cold, more cold hardy ones. And so where we've traditionally called caladiums zone nine to 11 perennials, we're now seeing creep into zone eight. And again, through plant breeding, we'll probably see more and more cold hardy varieties. People in colder areas can actually dig these up and store them through the winter, just like you would do dahlias or something like that. And a lot of people do that. Really, really love caladiums. They're gonna get really big really quickly during the summer. We do keep the, the roots on these mulched. They do uh, pretend, they like to have cool bottoms and hot tops. And you know, that, that, that's about the best case scenario for uh, growing caladiums. And then part shade, uh, to shade conditions, you know, anything with a big tropical looking leaf like this, you can typically pick out that it's going to need some afternoon shade. But I, I'm just blown away with how much caladiums have changed over the last two decades. Next up is impatiens. And I have sold and planted impatiens for 30 some years uh, in this business. They're not the most trouble free thing. Uh, in the world, but we've seen now through some plant breeding that they've gotten some downy mildew resistance and they've gotten some uh, resistance to some of the issues that they've had in the past. And so they seem to be much hardier, much more forgive, uh, you know, much more forgiving of different conditions in the garden. These typically like a little more moist soil. And I don't want to say wet, but they don't want to be, they don't want to stay super dry. Again, we, when we're doing our annual prep for our beds, and we have videos on the channel for prepping annual beds, we're adding a lot of organic material. Because the thing with these annuals is I, I have a short season with them, and I want to get as much out of them as I possibly can. And so we're doing a lot of soil prep to make that happen. One nice thing about impatience is typically you can find them in four packs and six packs. And so you can buy them in smaller sizes and then you, you know get a, lot of, get a lot of bang for your buck that way. This is another one, like everything in this video except for the Terenia, not a true annual. This is a hardy perennial down in like zone 10, 11. Tropical, a tropical perennial, but for us, we're using it as an annual. They're fantastic for pollinators. They'll grow quite a bit in a single season. They're humidity tolerant now. They're just more tolerant in general, again, through plant breeding. And you've got bright reds and pinks and magentas and all kinds of colors. Uh, showing up in these and just very few things are going to give you this much color in a park shade shade condition in the garden through the whole summer next up is bacopa this one's interesting it's a perennial in zone 8 to 11 something like that so kind of a tropical perennial but it's not super super heat tolerant in those areas it would bloom in cooler times of the year and then it would shut down during the summertime so what we do is you can grow it as an annual in colder areas and it'll take lots and lots of sun. By the time I get down here to zone seven where I'm using it as an annual, we put it in the park shade, uh, park shade conditions. It has kind of a bluish green foliage, more green than blue on this one. A uh, couple other things if you're trying to get blue foliage that are probably better than this. Uh, white flowers, lavender flowers, purple flowers, pink flowers. Flowers like crazy. This is one that would like to stay evenly moist if it dries out in the heat of the summer it will definitely just take a nosedive flowering really quickly until you get it rehydrated uh, in, in in the garden great in a container you know as as the speller over the side uh, anywhere in a again here in the mid-atlantic where we are uh, good in a, any kind of part shade condition where you need something to spill over the edge of you know of, of any spot in the garden but what a these are great, great plants. But again, in the deep south, they shut down a bit during the summertime. And in the north, they can take full sun. And then for us, we put them into park shade. So everybody's gonna do something different with Bacopa potentially, but they are definitely worth having, worth giving a try. And sometimes that's another thing about you know, annual plants. We change out our annual borders each year. We try new things. We carry over some things that were fantastic in years past, and we're, we're always trying something new. So if you, you, know, you pass by one of these, grab one, stick it in the edge of a container, and see how well it does for you in your area. Uh, but it should, it should reward you with flowers all summer long. Next up is hypoestes or polka dot plant. These come in all kinds of brightly colored variegations. You'll, you'll see the pink and green here, and then you know, right on the back of that same leaf, it's white and green which is tr truly amazing on on that one and you'll see 
uh, all different all different colors of, of variegations on these. These are mostly treated as annuals, but they can actually come in and be house plants. So you, this is one you can bring in and out if you want to. Not especially fast growing. They'll reach maybe one foot to two feet by two feet in a single season, but over the course of an entire summer. And again, you can bring it in in the, in the winter time if you want to. They like moist, well-drained soil. Uh, they have lavender pink flower spikes, but typically we'll cut those off, same as we talked uh, Steph talked about with the coleus, we'll you know, remove those flowers during the growing season to put more focus and energy into the leaf, which is actually much more showy than the flowers that come up on it. And then you can let it flower at the end of the season if you're going to treat it like an annual, and I'm sure the pollinators would appreciate that. They're heat and humidity tolerant, invasive in some countries in the world, but not here in, in, in our area. The, the winter kind of controls, controls that part of it. Uh, just part shade. Uh, you know, deep shade, you may lose some of this color, but part shade is kind of best on it. It'll probably take some morning sun, but that's about it. And then you can overwinter this with by taking a cutting if you wanted to. So you could, just like on the coleus, take a cutting, get it rooted, grow that during the winter time, and then come right back out with that. One of these, one of the things I like, you know, here's again, you can buy these in a four pack here. And so imagine if each of these becomes a foot by a foot or 18 inches by 18 inches, and you got four of them at one time, that's gonna be quite a lot of show, quite a lot of bang for the buck. So I think we just talked about 10 or 11 annuals and almost all of them were our actual perennials in, in Southern climate. So a lot of the things we use as annuals are actually perennials. If you have dogs that chew on plants, you might wanna look up uh, individual things that you're adding to your garden to see if they're poisonous. I know begonias is an example. My dog doesn't chew anything. I just don't have to worry about it. Griffin and Holly both, they're, they don't, they just don't seem to, you know, Griffin wants to lift his leg on the plants and that's about it. But other than that, he has no interest in them. So it's not something we have to worry about. If it is something you have to worry about, you might want to think through that. A few of the things that we just talked about uh, can have that issue. Again, we only talked about you know, 10 different annuals to use, or 11 for park shade. There's a lot more. I'll put up a list here on the screen. And you can use things like the spider plant, which can be used as, you know, a house plant through the winter. You can put it out in the garden in a container during the summer, or even put it in the ground and have a tropical looking uh, look to your, to your park shade or shade space. There's things like Tradescantia right here. Again, another one that can be brought in uh, during the winter. There's a lot of different ones of these. Uh, super, super interesting plants. Uh, there's strobilanthes or Persian shield. We always get these and use them in containers. But just tons of just foliage-based things rather than flowering things that really show up in dark spaces. That variegation on that spider plant versus that Persian shield, that purple right there, they look great together. They look great in a container, in a part shade or shade condition. So you don't have to just hunt flowers when you're hunting for things for part shade or shade for seasonal color. Seasonal color can just be foliage. So there you go. Uh, what are some of your favorite uh, annuals in your space? Uh, again, we put a lot of prep into these things. We're putting down compost. We're, we fertilize once in the spring uh, with an organic fertilizer and then midsummer I'll fertilize them again. And, that's, and then also midsummer we'll take a look if anything's getting too too tall for the space, too big for the space, or it's slowing down. Sometimes we'll give them a haircut just to kind of rejuvenate them and get them going for the season. Not a lot of maintenance really, but let us know down below what you use in your part shade or shade space for annual color. And thanks to Fairview Garden Center for letting us come out this morning and shoot part of the video. I hope I wasn't yelling too much because it was raining on us, but it stopped. Thanks for watching.